Hi everyone. Um, so yeah, I'm going to show you a couple of demos, some stuff. Um, so I was introduced quite well there, so um, I think I can skip that bit. Um, so yeah, I guess I'm going to demonstrate two things. And the first one I'm going to demonstrate to you is um, I'm going to try show what happens when your data gets leaked by somebody else that you've trusted. So when you trust like some third party with your information, like you give them your email address, say it's a service you've signed up to, be it LinkedIn or Dropbox or social networking sites like MySpace or dating sites or online shopping or whatever. When you give them your stuff, they sometimes may or may not tell you that they've lost it or they might not even know that they've lost it. So you have to be careful about what happens to your stuff when somebody else loses it for you, where you've done nothing wrong, you've use the internet in a normal way, like everyone else uses it, you've given a third party your data, and they go and lose it, how does this impact you? So I'm going to try and show a couple of stats and stuff to show how this could affect you and your business, um, why data leakage and stuff matters. So there's a website, Have I Been Owned, um, ran by an Australian chap called Troy Hunt, and he indexes 233 unique um, website breaches containing emails, usernames, passwords, and the like, which is a very small slice of how much data is out there, how much people's personal information has been leaked. He's just indexed a small amount of it. And I'm going to use stats from his site. Um, so he indexes only 233 data leaks, which accounts to 4.7 billion breached accounts, um, which is a lot of people. I mean, the plant's got, what, six and a half, seven billion people. There's 4.7 billion breached accounts, and it's actually a bit more than that now. And this is only a small slice of the amount of leaked information that's out there. So it's pretty big, pretty scary numbers, and you know it's a lot of data floating around. And again, Troy's website only indexes a small amount of what's actually out there, so he only gets what's public. Um, so again, that's only the publicly available data out there, which is all we have to work with. There's a lot more being traded on so-called dark web websites and you know on the black market and stuff. Personal information is valuable because it allows people to do stuff like fraud. So what's the impact of this? Well. If you search for companies, you'll find that 100% of the FTSE 50 are impacted by third-party leaks. You'll find every single one in the top of the FTSE 50 that some of their data has ended up in some third-party service that's ended up being negligent with that data and leaking it. Um, with the Fortune 100, again, we have this wonderful number of 100%. Everybody's affected. It affects everyone equally. It doesn't matter how big you are, how good your security is. Once you start trusting your data to somebody else, it's going to go walkabouts, and that's problematic. So I decided to demonstrate what exactly happens um, very quickly when your password winds up on the internet. Um, you know, OK, so your MySpace password's gotten leaked, or your snowboarding.com or your last minute account, you know, the password gets leaked, and you're just kind of like, oh, well, I'll just change my password on that website. How does this impact me? Why does this matter? Um, so people try to use it, um, criminals and the likes, they'll come along and they'll take that email and password and they'll test it out in just about every web service they can find. They'll think, oh, what if they reuse their password on, say, Amazon or PayPal or Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn or everywhere else? So what happens next generally with normal people who reuse their passwords all the time is their email gets compromised, their LinkedIn, their Facebook, their PayPal, they could end up with phishing emails sent to their colleagues, or spam sent from their accounts, or money stolen, or general bad things. And it doesn't take particularly long to um, check if a person's password has, you know, if they've reused it somewhere. So we set up some test accounts um, on a few services and wrote a quick script that would demonstrate this. And I hope it works. So this, this just demonstrates how fast. Um, we can test a set of passwords across 20 different web services. We're adding support for more of them to our little tool. Um, we use it for testing for clients and stuff if their stuff's gotten leaked, or rather, if their stuff is being reused anywhere. Um, and it just takes less than a minute or so to run. And what it does is it takes a username and password, which isn't being displayed on the screen for obvious reasons, so I don't want you logging into our test account. It tries to log into 20 different sites, um, and in about a minute, it quickly dumps out a list of sites that login worked on. Now imagine if this wasn't test accounts and this was just, and this was your email and password that got leaked from say, a dating site. Say, Mate1 or Zoosk, which have been breached in the past. 
somebody gets those passwords and then tries them on Facebook, Twitter, Amazon, GitHub, Gmail, PayPal, LinkedIn, whatever, how would that impact you? You might, you know, you go, oh, my Facebook's getting hacked. It wasn't your Facebook that got hacked. It was some third-party service, and then your password just got recycled and used. And that ends up being a pretty crap situation because within a matter of, like, a couple of minutes, most of your online life can be just taken away from you. Somebody now has control over your stuff. They can pull more of your information from it, commit fraud, for example, with PayPal. They could empty your balance or... They could buy a bunch of stuff on Amazon, or they could send loads of horrible messages to your friends on Facebook, or whatever it is that you can imagine they can do that's bad, they can probably do it. And you can go and check, if you go to haveibeenowned.com, you put in your email address, it'll tell you how many sites your passwords or your email has shown up in leaked information from those sites. Um, and it gets pretty scary, because when you, re you can sign up for notifications, well, you can sign up as a business for notifications from them, and they'll tell you if any of your employees' stuff's been leaked. And it can be pretty terrifying when you first put your email in and you go, oh, I didn't know about that. You know, it can often be, Troy Psy can be the first time that you get notified of your stuff has been leaked. So it's useful to kind of have a think about who you're trusting your information with, um, where that information goes, and what happens if somebody you trust isn't very trustworthy with your stuff. Um, you know, maybe they, you know, maybe all the new regulations, GDPR and all that will result in fines or something, not holding out too much hope. Um, people are just going to continue being negligent with stuff you give them. So as for mitigating this, um, if you want to mitigate the risk to yourself and to your business of password reuse style attacks, which are very common, they happen all the time, you can do a couple of things. And if come up with like three simple takeaways that you can use to mitigate the risk of third party breaches impacting you, your customers, um, your employees, whatever. So the first one is use a password manager that generates unique per site passwords. You can use LastPass, Dashlane, KeePass, whatever. I'm not gonna shill for any particular product or vendor. Um, they're all pretty much the same. They all have their pros and cons. Have a look, maybe read some reviews, see which one suits you best. The um, KeePass is free, the other two are commercial services. Um, and that's a good first line, because that means that if your passwords are actually unique and strong across all the services that you use, it means that when they leak from one, it's isolated, it's contained, it's the damage is segregated. It'll only affect that service and it won't affect everything else. The second one is you should definitely use two-factor. It's 2017. We've got loads of lovely products and services that allow you to use two-factor. Um, the stuff like YubiKey, which is a little USB thing. I forgot to bring mine with me today, but it's a little gadget that you plug in and does the second step for authentication. A lot of services support it. There's also Google Authenticator and Authy, which are mobile apps, so you can you know, authorize with one-time codes from your phone. Some banks support similar things, like the Bank and Width. Um, they posted me a little, um, little key fob type thing that I type in a pin, it generates a login code. You should definitely use something like that. At very minimum, have stuff like Gmail set up so it texts you every time somebody tries to log in, you have to put in a code. Because that means that even if somebody nicks your password, it's completely bloody useless. They can't go anywhere further than that, unless the, unless horrible things on the service that they're trying to log into end, like broken two-factor implementation, but that's not really something you can defend against. And the third thing you can do is, if you're signing up for like, dating sites or whatever, or arbitrary service, and I see a lot, it's mostly dating sites we actually find <coughs> data leaks from that affects corporates. For some reason, people seem to think, I'll sign up for Ashley Madison, my work account, because nobody at home will find out. What happens is um, HR don't look too kindly on that when, you know. <laughs> so um, create new email accounts. It takes like, what, two minutes to set up a burner Gmail account for whatever service you're putting your stuff into. Um, just have a think before you trust things to your information. Like, if you just do those three things, you're not going to have that many, you know, you've mitigated a ton of the problems that you could have had otherwise. Um, the second thing I'm going to talk about is kind of to do with the WannaCry and Yetia things, which impacted, like, the WannaCry and Yetia ransomwares that happened this year. They impacted pretty much most businesses had some kind of horrible experience with them, I reckon. Um, a lot of people haven't said that they were affected, but if you just look at the impact in Yetnia, where I think it was Maersk, the shipping company, had to switch to paper or some nonsense, you know, it just took out everything. And the WannaCry and Yetnia things were completely avoidable. They were, you know, there was, they were totally avoidable incidents. Um, 
And they're a very good case study in why installing patches on time for your endpoints is really important. Why, when the little Windows update thing pops up in the corner, you shouldn't just click, oh, bugger off, I'll do it tomorrow. You should do, oh, I should probably do this now, or else all my stuff might get locked away forever. <laughs> um, so we all know what happened there. I mean, the media covered it. It was wall-to-wall -wall coverage. We all know that people's stuff got encrypted. They didn't get a lot of it back. Um, horrible bad things happened. The NHS got wrecked. Um, somebody saved the day in the case of the WannaCry thing. <coughs> you know, it's a fairly well-known story. What instead I'm going to talk about with regards to that is MS1710, which is basically probably the biggest thing in probably cyber security stuff that happened this year was just how <coughs> universal it worked. And it was every single version of Microsoft Windows was vulnerable to this unauthenticated, which means no login required, remote exploit that gave you system privilege, the highest privilege level on basically anything. So it was like a skeleton key for every unpatched Windows machine at the time. And when it leaked, absolute bloody mayhem occurred. Um, hence, we had the <coughs> ransomware and stuff kick off. So it affected everything, um, like literally every version of Windows, from Windows 2000 up to Windows 10 and Server 2016. There are exploits available in public for these. Um, the only Windows that probably was in effect was like Windows 95 or something. Um, but if it was connected to the internet and it was running Windows and it, it's not patched, it's probably already compromised. You need to unplug it, set it on fire, and get a new computer, or reinstall it, or whatever. Um, and you probably need to shoot your sysadmin. Um, if you've not patched, the question you should be asking across your organization is, why haven't we patched this? Why haven't we applied mitigations and fixed this? Um, and then when somebody gives you a reason, you need to go, is that a good enough reason? And I've heard, re like, I've gone to client sites, and I've found they're still vulnerable to this. And they've told me, oh, we just haven't had time to, you know, have like an hour scheduled downtime yet. And I'm like, mate, the patch came out months ago. You know, you're being willfully and criminally negligent at this point with your client information. You know, there's no way that you can't schedule a one hour outage um, or, you know, do a rollout over a week or so. There's no good reason for not having patched, like literally none. Um, so I'm going to show you how fast this thing works, and hopefully this demo works. Um, but this just shows how fast and how simple it is to infect an unpatched Windows machine with ransomware using the MS1710 exploit that WannaCry and NetEU used to spread. So here we've got our lovely Windows XP machine. I'm using XP because it's about the only thing that I can run a VM on my laptop without turning into a space heater. Um, and here we have just a quick demo exploit that I'll hit run, stuff <coughs> happens, prints out a bunch of debug output, and then we wait a minute. And we should see within about 60 seconds um, something awful happen. Just have to wait a bit for um, the horrible pop-up screen of, oh, God. Oh, yeah, there we go. That's the, now it's completely toast. Um, you can kiss goodbye to any files on that machine. Um, you can try pay a ransom. Um, I wouldn't trust them with my Bitcoins. But yeah, it happens in a couple of seconds. And the tools for doing this are publicly available for free online. Any idiot can just download them, package up their own little bit of ransomware, and then spam it out at every Windows machine they can think from the internet that's vulnerable to this just indiscriminately. And then suddenly, oh no, my files are gone. Well, we should have had some backups. Um, Generally not a good day for anyone, especially not for the IT department, who are going to be getting lots of unpaid overtime. So that, it all happens ridiculously fast. I better kill that machine. I'll just be a second. Um, I'll just turn that machine off in case it does something horrible while I'm not looking, <laughs> like infect something else. So as you can see, it just happens instantaneously. Like there's a couple of seconds for the malware to execute, but the infection takes like no time at all. and this is terrifying because unless you've patched, you're kind of screwed when it comes to defending against this. And it's entirely <coughs> silent. There's no user interaction required. Like, the user doesn't have to open a dodgy link in an email. They just have to have their computer connect to the network and not have installed the required patches. And this ends up being like users' workstations, they, you know, their laptops they take home, their bring your own back door policy, whatever. Um, that ends up being like a little infection vector that screws everyone. So what can you do regarding mitigations? And the obvious one is patch, patch your stuff, um, install the updates on time. They don't, you know, I, 
I mean, we all probably have our little gripes about Microsoft and patches and stuff and their products, but like, they don't deliver patches and updates for no reason. They don't do it just to piss you off and cause downtime. They do it because their product is acting defectively and they're trying to repair a defect. And that's the other thing. We should see this as not a bug. We should see this as a software defect, as in defective product, and this is a repair for the defect. It's not just fixing some glitch. Um, you should segregate your networks. Um, you should make it harder for worms such as WannaCry and NetYear to spread. You should put things on, you should talk to your IT department about putting things on isolated and separate networks. Because otherwise, if, like most large enterprises that have visited in the UK, their networks are just this glorious big flat land, which is like, a playground for any kind of nasty that wants to zip around. And it's a playground for me when I go there to ruin their stuff, when they pay me for that, of course. Um, if you segregate your networks and put in access <coughs> controls on top of patching, you're going to make people like me or people like the WannaCry people have a really, really hard time. And finally, you should, you should manage privileges on your networks. A lot, of, a lot of the stuff gets in because and gets around because people don't have effective privilege management. They just have, oh yeah, of course our users can run everything as admin if they want. You know, we trust our users. No, don't trust your users. Your users are actively hostile to your business. They'll <laughs> click stuff, they'll ignore the update prompts, consider them to be like bloody children, right? You don't want to give them enough rope to hang themselves with, you don't want to give them forks near power sockets, whatever. You know, they will screw you up. They will lose you money. So don't give them admin rights. Don't give them, you know, a way to hurt you. It's you know, it's something that we should all be doing, but you end up with like that annoying power user is like, oh no, I need admin to do blands. Like, no, actually, mate, you don't. You don't need to be logged in as admin. Um, you know, nobody does. I mean, what do most people do? They send emails, they do some Excel in Office. They need a limited user account for that. They run a couple of bits of whatever software they do. They don't need local admin in their computer. They need, in fact, some of them don't even need computers, but that's beside the point. <laughs> um, yeah, you should. If you do those three things, like if you make sure to patch stuff, um, segregate your networks, and have good privilege management and good policies around that, you're going to be I'm not going to say immune, but you're going to be far lower on the risk scale than everyone else. And that's the whole thing. You just want to be less at risk than everyone else, and that kind of sums up the main points one to make. So I guess I'll leave. And the demos actually worked without retrying them a few times, way ahead of time. So I guess um, I'll leave it open to questions and stuff. Yeah, um, I mean, it's great how we've gone from humans being the best line of defense to take away all the computers. Uh, and I'm going to start running Windows 95. I didn't realize that was the best way to stay safe. Um, does anyone have any questions straight off the bat? Um, Darren? I'm, I've got one for you, um, which is, I mean, you were there on the front line, say, for WannaCry, analyzing the malware through the night, ruined everyone's weekend. Um, when you're seeing it, what do you see as the big trends to come in terms of what adversaries are doing, what hackers are looking at? So I honestly think that like we've seen a big uptick in it's gone towards ransomware as opposed to previously it was sort of banking malware that would steal your banking logins and stuff. That's proving a lot harder for criminals to cash out. So we're seeing a lot of like from the organized criminal groups who are just in it for the money, it's moving towards the ransomware model, which is very smash and grab. They hit you, encrypt all your stuff, demand some money, you pay up really quick and then they're gone. Um, it's all about faster cash out. It's all about automation and doing stuff fast, doing stuff easy. Um, we're going to see a lot more horrible ransomware in the future. Um, you know, it's just getting the bars being lowered. People are paying up, and that's the thing. Happy days. And and what, I mean, with the WannaCry, like you say, these were really old systems that need a patching. Microsoft announced it. Um, but what's it like for a business? So that exploit was discovered, allegedly, again, I keep using that word, by the Equation Group, which is the NSA American equivalent of GCHQ, their hacking group. Uh, you know, one of the most be best resourced hacking group in the world, one of the most adventurous. Um, their secrets were stolen, and then they were exploited by this one acquired, potentially by, allegedly, North Korean hackers, Lazarus Group. Um, then you've got the poor NHS in the middle of all of that. Does it stand a chance against these sort of nation states fighting over all this cyber turf? Cyber turf, what an awful phrase, but yeah. Honestly, probably not. Yeah. Um, that's like, honestly, the NHS kind of, to put it bluntly, completely toast um, when it comes to trying to protect themselves because they don't have the budget. Um, they don't have the budget or the manpower, and they've got huge networks with you know thousands and thousands of users. 
if something gets in, it's going to be a really bad day. And WannaCry was just a wonderfully horrendous example of it, especially what with the timing and just how destructive it was. You know, when it hit stuff up until the kill switch was discovered and all that, mm. when it found stuff, it just toasted everything. You know, everything got encrypted, no way of recovering stuff. Um, there was eventually a few ways to recover things, which relied on the computer not having been powered off, etc. But there's not much chance at effectively defending against nation state attackers. Um, that'd be a problem for GCHQ. Mm -hmm. They should be protecting their country against nation states, um, against other nation states. But they should, you know, it shouldn't be their problem. Mm -hmm. um, they should be able to defend themselves against your lesser resourced criminals, and they should have the budget to defend themselves, and they should be able to hire the expertise to do so. But at the moment, they can't. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, any. Okay, great. Oh, uh, two here. Sorry, I missed you guys. Um, yeah. Just following on from that question, hi, Caroline Noble from James Cropper PLC. Uh, we talked about governments, and you know, obviously, there's been a lot of press about what the U.S. government did or didn't know about WannaCry. But if you take the next one, which was PTO or not PTO, whatever you want to call it, and um, there's a lot of commentary afterwards about large cybersecurity companies and their interests with government or links to government that are not out necessarily to support us as a, as a UK nation. Should we be worried as uh, IT leaders about what software and what companies we use for cybersecurity? Um, this is, I mean, presumably a reference to Kaspersky, which has been alleged by the FBI. Allegedly, I wasn't going to say yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> and they deny it. But it's interesting because, you know, it's a I think it's worth getting the name out just to talk about it. Not to talk about Kaspersky mm. in particular, but sh is that something vendors should be worried about? Um, there should be some concern. Um, with that particular case, I don't. I believe that a lot of the accusations are somewhat baseless. Um, but there should be, people should be at least somewhat concerned where the software they're running comes from. You should have a look into your vendors. You know, if you're trusting a security product vendor to put stuff on your network, which effectively has maximum privileges over your stuff. Like an antivirus can, you know, can look at all your files. It can, it sends them home. Um, it can do an awful lot of really horribly invasive stuff. So you want to have a good, you know, good trust between you and the vendor. And be it, you know, you choose a domestic vendor from, you know, if you're UK based, you could choose a UK vendor, I guess. But I mean, you should probably base it on who's the most trustworthy, but also who does the job the best. Um, if you're paying for a product, it should work. Um, and you should, you know, it's a difficult one because countries are going to sling mud at, you know, the AV vendor of another country. And now that that kind of game has started, it's not going to stop. Um, it's a difficult one, but yeah, you should kind of, I guess you should kind of think about who you're trusting to run stuff on your network. Um, it's definitely something of concern because if it turns out that a vendor is um, kind of subject, you know, if they're behaving in a way that's not exactly in the best interest of their customers, um, you should definitely run away from them. It's, you should wait for proof, though, as opposed to accusations, because um, baseless accusations without any publicly viewable evidence help nobody. Yeah, um, question there. Yeah, so I just wondering, what, what's your insight into malware that's delivered through video? Uh, is this a, it's a new trend, or is it, is it similar to, to any other delivery mechanism, or is it something we should be worried about? Um, pretty much all delivery mechanisms are almost, um, I treat them all almost equally. Um, a way to run code on a computer is a way to run code, you know, a way to execute your malware on somebody's system is, you know, they're all pretty much equal. Some of them, for a time, will have a higher probability of success than others, like, I remember age school, you used to be able to just email somebody an attachment and they'd open it. Because that's what people do with attachments, they open it. Now I guess if it's, you know, if it's video files or bugs in video players, um, I guess it'd be, have a higher chance of execution than sending them like dodgy.exe. But um, you should treat it the same as every other kind of delivery vector. Because the actual thing you should be worried about isn't the delivery vector, it's the payload. The bit that gets run, you should ideally be concerned about anything getting run on your computers you don't want getting run there. Um, you should try block as many delivery vectors as you can, but realistically it's the payload that counts, because they'll just find another way to get it to you. Great. Um, Darren, thank you very much indeed. Cheers.